So 12 years ago, almost 12 years ago today, Hassani and I set out to have an adventure, okay? We didn't know that we were about to walk into our wilderness. Um, we had just turned a corner in our marriage. We were doing well. Um, we had worked out a lot of our issues. Y'all know we came through some stuff. We had four small children. My youngest was six months old. And we decided that we were going to have an experience. We were going to leave the country. We were gonna move to Costa Rica, okay? And so what we began to do, this, this was a decision that we made after a lot of research. And so what we did is we saved up a lot of money and we went to Costa Rica to stay there for a month and feel out the territory, see what we think, find a place to live. We were gonna do this, we were gonna live there for a year, that was the plan. So we went to Costa Rica, we stayed in this nice Airbnb in the province of Grecia. Has anybody ever been to Costa Rica? All right, anybody been to Grecia? Nope, one person? Okay, that's all right, because I, I, we ain't never heard of it either. Actually, it's up in the mountains. It's pretty cool up there. Uh, lots of very interesting large bugs. Um, very interesting and dangerous spiders and snakes and things. It's really a very tropical area. But we stayed up there and in this house, we were given <coughs> access to the owner's car. And so we could drive around and look at different places. And so that's what we did. We had somebody tour us around. We were driving around. And we ended up going to the province of Alajuela. Anybody been there? Alajuela? Nope, okay, well, it's a beautiful place. It felt more like home. We're from Jersey, we're Jersey natives. And you could walk down the street, you could go to the bodega, you could, it just felt like home. You had sidewalks, it was more organized, it was more like what we were used to. Gracie was more third world, but not really, but a little bit less what we were used to. So we really liked it. And there was this house that we saw there. It was a family home property. There were like four homes in there. At the entrance was a beautiful gate. The driveway was lined with these meticulously like cleaned up palm trees. Everything was just so beautiful. And we loved this home. When you walked into the home, the, artic the, the um, architecture was amazing. You would step down into this living room and it had like gardens on the inside of the home. Have you ever seen that? Like what you see in the mall where there's like built-in gardens and palm trees in the home. It was just really nice and cheap. I mean, this was about 12 years ago. It was really cheap, right? So we were stunned. We love this home. That's the home we wanted. We went, ha we went ahead, put an offer. They told us no. We were like, man, you know, we really wanted this house, but they told us no. So we went and we looked at other houses, nothing else really settled. We were trying to figure it out. And the place where we were staying, they said, you know what? We, we can rent our house to you for a year. How about that? We'll rent the house to you for a year. And you can also have the car with it. So we were like, cool, we'll do that. We'll take that offer. So we went ahead, agreed with them. We were gonna stay in Gracia for the year for our adventure. We went back home to the States. We started saving up our money and preparing for this big move, okay? I'm getting somewhere, y'all, just listen. When we got home, we had pretty much deleted, depleted all of our finances, so we had to start saving and preparing. We started selling everything that we had because we were leaving. We were taking our essentials and shipping them over, but we were leaving for a year. This was an adventure, y'all. We found, there were some folks at our church that needed a place to stay. It was perfect. We were renting. We were gonna be gone for a year. Our rent was super cheap. We subleased it to them. We were making some income, almost double what we were paying because our rent was so cheap that doubling the rent was still under market value. So we were set, we had income. We also were entrepreneurs at the time, so we had the ability to travel anyway. We weren't bankrolling, we didn't make a lot of money, we were struggle busting, but hey, we could pay the bills, right? We gave our car to those people, so we had no car. Six months passed, we were ready to go. We were moving to Costa Rica. We had no place to stay here because we had tenants moving in in three days. We had our place secured in Costa Rica and a car. We were straight, the adventure will begin. Three days before we were to set off to Costa Rica and get on a plane, the owners of the house in Gracia called and said, psych, we are not renting this house to you. We, things have changed. And we said, well, can you rent a car? Nope, you cannot rent the car. We were like, wow. Stand up, Hassani. 
And we were, we were, we were like, what are we going to do? Turn around. I want you to know that for the first maybe seven, eight, nine years of our marriage, me and Hassani's position with each other was like this. We were like this. My way, his way. By the time this situation came around, we were like this, right? We were like positioned. We were anchored. Pull on me a little bit. I'm immovable. We're immovable, okay? So when this happened and they said, nope, we're not going to rent to you, we had already had our, our mind, our vision, our heart set on what we were going to do. We knew what we were going to do. So we said, oh, well, let's get busy figuring it out. We started looking at hotels that we were going to rent. We were going to go and we were going to make it work. We we're going to figure it out because I don't think so. Not today, Satan. Okay? And so that's what we did. We started planning. We started calling. We were going to go stay at a hotel. We were going to go anyway because it was an adventure. We were going to figure it out. We'll find a place when we get there because guess what? We had saved up enough money. We were okay. We had the renters. They were going to be sending money every month. We felt like we were good. A day before our trip, we got a call. It was the owners of that house that I told you about with the gate and the beautiful palm tree line driveway. They called us six months later saying, do you guys perhaps still need a place to stay? We're just, we're just checking. Do you need a place to stay? Because we're still available. We said, yes, yes we do. And we thought, how on earth could something like this happen? What are the odds that we would actually still need a place six months later? What on earth triggered that person to call us just to see? Think about that. We said yes, we got on our flight, we went to the home. Now we still had some issues, because guess what? It wasn't furnished, it was partially furnished, but we still had to figure out some things. That was the beginning of the wilderness. I want to remind you that the children of Israel, they came out victoriously, didn't they? I mean, the sea parted. They were like, yeah, could you imagine it? If they had a beatbox, they would have been like, boom, boom, boom. They would have had their music. They would have been jamming because they came out victoriously. But when they got into the wilderness, that's when the struggle bus happened, right? It wasn't leaving because we left victoriously. At first, we were like, how are we going to do this? We're going to figure it out. And then God came through and, and he, he fixed it. But then we went to Costa Rica, y'all. And that's when the crazy bus really took over. We didn't have any furniture. We had to make calls to find out how we were going to make that happen. My kids, they were little still, but I still had kids that needed to go to school. Very shortly after we got there, the renters in our house decided that they were going to bypass us and go to the owners of the property and make a deal with them and cut us out. So we had no income coming in. So our income got cut. That dream house in Costa Rica had no internet. So we could not continue to do our business. So we had no work. We were in trouble quick, but we were still standing. We were still standing in the power of agreement. So there's a scripture that I want to read to you. It's powerful. I'm going to read it slowly. And I think I can read it here, right? Here. And it says, this is Genesis 11:6. And the Lord said, behold, this is God on high looking down. Behold. Read it, Hassani, slowly. Behold. They are one people. And they have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. That's God. That's what God said. He said, behold, look at my people down there on the earth. They have come together and they have one heart and they have one mind. Nothing that they decide to do will be kept from them. They can do anything. Even when all the stakes are against you, you can do anything. When the carpet and the rug is pulled out from under your feet, you can still do anything. When you understand the power of agreement. 
And I need you to understand, you know, Satan is super crafty, isn't he? He does a lot of work to get us angry and at odds with each other. He really loves it when we are in disagreement. That is why one of the famous coin statements out there is, well, let's just agree to disagree. Let's agree to disagree. You see it your way, I see it my way. No. We must begin to move into agreeing to agree on something, on anything. All right, Hassan. And when you do that, everything begins to change. But the reality is the enemy, as she said, is constantly working against your marriage. And the enemy will allow strife and contention and argument and disagreement and everything to fill the atmosphere of your home to keep you at odds with one another. One of the things that we say, and you probably heard us say it again and again and again, and we stand on it, that we truly believe that marriage is God's secret weapon for kingdom domination in the earth. So beyond the benefits of your marriage, there is a purpose for your marriage. And just as God put purpose into the DNA and the fabric of your unity, the enemy knows that. So he'll use anything to get in between the two of you to create discord. And so that is why Couples Academy is committed to helping couples eradicate the pain that they're going through so that they can begin to experience the pleasure so that then they can tap into the power of their partnership. Yes, yes. Yeah, when I look around this room, I'm like, look at all the potential miracles. There's so many miracles in this room when you learn how to stand in agreement. We are so caught up in offense. We're offended with each other, so we can't come into an alignment. And we can't agree on something. I don't care what it is on anything. You know, when we were in Costa Rica, there were a lot of issues and hurdles that we had to overcome. One of the things, like I said, was my kids had to go to school. We didn't know how we were going to do it because we lost all of our income. We had no internet. We couldn't even do business. We were like, what are we going to do? But we were there to test the word of God and to prove it to be true or a lie. That was the mission. And so we said, okay, we're going to literally stand on this word. We're going to see if this word is what it says. Because if it is what it says, then it's going to prove to be a miracle. If it's not right, then we're going to have some questions to answer. And so it was interesting because where I moved across the street was a lady. She had two kids. She told me about the school that her kids go to. And she said, they need teachers. I said, oh, okay, I'm in technology. Um, let me have a meeting with him and see about that school. I went to this, have a meeting. I went to a church. I went to talk to this man. We just started talking about life, where I was from, what I did. He said, you know what? I could use a teacher like you who specializes in technology. Um, and all your kids can come to my school for free. So we'll just do an exchange. You teach and all your kids can come to school for free. This was a private, a, a very uh, expensive private school. It included all the meals so the kids were taking place, taken care of. We also had, I mean, we were living like kings and queens over there. You wouldn't think that we were on the struggle bus and broke, but that's the manna of God that was coming down every day. I mean, we lived in a beautiful home. We had uh, people coming in and helping us clean, put your groceries away, cut our fruit. I mean, it's, it, it was really inexpensive to do it, but we didn't have the money. But every day we would say, all right, Hassan, let's touch and agree. Let's stand on this word. Lord, we just thank you for the provision in the name of Jesus. And we would check in and we would be like, are you still holding on? I'm still holding on. Okay, holding is on? there any doubt? No doubt. Okay, so let's keep moving. And every day, their provision would come. It was the literal manna of God. And so here's the thing, y'all. This is, this is what we're about to break into because we want you to understand how to manifest the miracles of God. Do you think that Jesus for one minute didn't know what he was doing? Hello? Hello? He knew what he was doing. He wasn't ignorant. He knew who his God was. He didn't forget. The children of Israel, they kept forgetting. They literally forgot every day because the manna and the quail, well, first the manna came, then the quail came. He kept providing, but they kept complaining. They let fear stop them. They let discomfort stop them. They let murmuring and complaining stop them, and they ended up wandering for 40 years. What was the journey supposed to be it was supposed like? To be 20 like twenty-six day journey that turned into forty years because they kept murmuring and kept complaining. And guess what? They kept looking at the facts. And if they truly understood that the facts don't matter, 
And the problem is you and your relationship, you're looking at the circumstances, yeah. you're looking at the conditions, you're looking at the facts, you're looking at your spouse, and you're seeing all of these visual reminders as to why it can't work, how it's never gonna get any better, things are never gonna turn around, and because you're so zoned in and focused on what won't work, you don't tap into the power of God that lives within you to begin to experience manifestation in your life. So we're going to break this thing down. We're going to give you a teaching yeah. because here's the fact. Here's the fact. Look at this. Oopsie. A weak mind produces a weak marriage. Yes. Boom. I'm going to say that again. A weak mind produces a weak marriage. So for the first few years of our marriage, when we were going through hell, we allowed our circumstances to get in our mind. We looked at every reminder, every piece of evidence that supported the notion that this would not work. Yes. Not only did we have surroundings that supported the belief that it didn't work, we were connected to other relationships that weren't working. That's right. So, so, so uh, we, there was no example, there, there was no individual, no couple that we could look at to see any type of hope that's why we had to change our environment. Right, and when, you, when you're surrounded by people that don't have hope, because we are, oftentimes, you know, our family, they don't see things the way that you see things, and they really, they have your best interests at heart, but you're going through and they're like, you don't have to take this, you're better than this. They even use scripture on you. You're the head, not the tail. You don't have to take this from your spouse. And they're driving a wedge between you. We didn't have anybody 360 degrees around us to say to us, this is the way, this is the road. And that's why we dialed deep into the word of God because that was where we were gonna find our compass. That was where we were gonna get grounded and use that word to guide us to our next destination. So the question is, what limiting beliefs are holding you back from having the life and the marriage that you want? I want you to sit in that for a second because, because the reality is, as human beings, we think 50 to 60,000 thoughts a day whether you're conscious of these thoughts or not. Because of your senses, when you open up your eyes, it's taking in so much information and so many thoughts are running through your head. However, there are these dominating beliefs or dominating thoughts that continue to consume your mind every single day. And oftentimes, those dominating thoughts are negative thoughts. And so the question, the rhetorical question that I have for you is, what are the negative thoughts that you are thinking about yourself? because of what you've gone through in your relationship. What negative thoughts are you thinking about your spouse? Every time you peek over and look at them, what's running through your head? What negative thoughts do you have about your marriage? See, because every time you think these thoughts, day in and day out, day in and day out, they become cemented in your subconsciousness. And they form a deeply embedded belief system that governs how you function in your life. And so if there are negative thoughts that you've held on to, isn't it true that there was a book written called The Battlefield of the Mind, how the enemy is constantly trying to give you suggestions and reminders and lies and of truths and, and reminders of all the past pains so that if he can get it in your mind all of a sudden, if he's got your mind, he's got your body. And so you begin to move out and walk out in correspondence with the thoughts that you think. So it's all right here, folks. So, so the key is how do you begin to change that? Well, the scripture says, Romans 12, Two, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, this is something that we can quote because many of us have become quotologists. But how do you live this thing out? There is a practical approach to transforming your mind, which will impact the marriage that you have that we want to walk you through. So let's get into some teaching. Here's, here's a powerful slide here. It says, if you want to change, you must, if you want to change, you must have it in your thoughts. An idealized marriage, a model that you can emulate, which is different from and better than the marriage that exists today. Meaning that you have to come up with a new conception. I, I was thinking about this and we were talking about this last night. I said, I know what I thought about you, Hassani. I thought you will never change. I don't care how many times I say it, every time you say, okay, I'm gonna do better next time. In my mind, the record that kept on playing over and over again was, he will never change. And I had wondered, what, what was it about me that you didn't think would ever change? And I don't think you had figured that one out yet. <laughs> I'll, never be, I'll never be good enough. Oh! I'll never be good enough for you. Wow. But you are. You are good enough for me. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> 
But you know what? Because we were talking about this last night, and I'm like, I never knew. What was it that you thought over and over again? Because we do. We have a, a conceptualized, brick and mortar idea stoned in our head about our spouse, who they are, and more importantly, who they're not. Why do we allow the soil of our minds to be penetrated with those negative seeds every single day? When a simple shift is to begin to plant seeds of the potential of who they could be. How practical is that? Like we make it mystical, like it's gotta be a miracle that happens. Miracles, actually, if you break down a miracle, there's an, a scientific explanation as to how that happened. I mean, God, God's a scientist, if you think about it. Look at all this stuff he created. He created the heavens and the earth, all these chemicals and all this energy and all this stuff. God created it, y'all. So there is an explanation for the miracles that take place. Why don't we start to learn how to master the power of creating our own miracles by changing the way that we think? So, do, you, do you realize that everything that is created began with a thought? Do you realize that? Do you realize that these beautiful chandeliers, really, they did not drop from heaven? God did not fashion those lampshades and all of that. He didn't do that. Somebody had an idea, and they created that idea. And now we get to be blessed with the light of the chandelier. Everything is created, and you are creative beings, and you have the ability to create whatever it is you desire. Do me this real quick, and I'm, I'm going I'm to stop. But one, one thing I want you to do is everybody just close your eyes. Close your eyes and grab your partner's hand. Eyes closed. I want you to feel your partner's hand. You know what it feels like. Feel the skin. You know they got rough spots, some of them. They needed lotion today. But feel it. Now let go of that hand. Can you remember what it felt like? Can you remember the warmth? Do you remember that crusty spot? Where is it? You don't have to say it out loud, but you know where it's at. That's that same spot that scratched you last night. <laughs> I ain't lying. Who are you talking about, Daniel? Nobody. <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> now, close your eyes again. I want you to imagine a green tennis ball in your hand. Now feel it. Can you feel it? Can you feel that fuzz? Can you feel the rubber? That is the creative power that God gave you. You are not subject to the thoughts that the enemy puts in your mind. The world has mastered how to control you. It controls you through McDonald's commercials, car commercials, and everything else out here to tantalize you. Facebook, now forget television, it's all online. Now your phone is the biggest weapon if you're using it wrong to tantalize your imagination and cause you to create mess in your life that you do not want. But you have the ability to transform those thoughts into something that you desire. Start with your marriage. So I want you... So year three, when we were on the verge of divorce, we were in the worst place that we could possibly be. Maybe some of you are there right now. Maybe you came here because you were looking for something that you could hold on to that could give you an idea, an inspiration that anything can be better than this. Maybe you have a pretty decent relationship, but you know there's something more for you. Whatever that is, how do you get change to take place in your marriage? Let's read it again. If you want change, you must have in your thoughts an idealized marriage a model that you can emulate, which is different from and better than the marriage that exists today. The only reason that we are standing here today is because when we were in our darkest place, we had an image. Yes. We had an image that we held on to, even though there was no confidence that it could ever happen as long as we looked at our circumstances. That's why I love the scripture that says that we walk by faith, not by sight. So faith, we had to tap into the invisible realm 
because that's where all possibilities lie. As long as I looked at my circumstances, I would have remained trapped in the pit that we were in. And so you gotta hold on to this image. What's the image? What is it that you want for your marriage? What is it that you're seeking? Who are you looking at that represents an example of that ideal re of marriage that you want? If you don't have a couple that you personally know, who from a distance do you look at and say, man, I wish we had what they had? If you can't identify a couple, create the marriage that you want. Get together with your partner and start writing down notes and trying to figure out what is it that you want in this marriage. This is what I want in this marriage. And then when you come together and touch and agree, you have this image and now you're going to model it until it manifests into your life. So, so in order to get what it is that you say that you want, you got to create a goal for it. Now, many of you who have jobs and careers and you're in education and you have personal things that you're working on, we get the concept of creating a goal. When you establish a goal, you walk towards that goal. But when it comes to your marriage, how many of us are truly goal setting? And so I want to share with you the ABC goals that many of us engage in. Number one, a goals, A goals are doing what you already know how to do. So, so really, that's not really a goal. It's just something you wrote down as a check off. I got to get this done. These are the things you already know how to do. But then B goals are pursuing what you think you can do. Maybe there's no evidence of it yet, but you realize if this is right and these conditions are right and if I connect with those people, yeah, I can see how I can make this thing happen. But C goals are where the miracle is. C goals is pursuing what you have no idea how to do. See, when we were in our darkest hour, we didn't know how we were going to get there. It didn't matter. You know why it didn't matter? Because there's something called the training balance scale. Now, if you ever go into a gym or if you go into the doctor's office and you get on that scale and they've got the lever that, you know, it tells you what your weight is, there's 50-50 weight on both sides to determine what your weight is. Well, the training balance scale isn't 50-50, it's 90-10. 90-10. So on the left side of the training balance scale, where 90% of your focus should be, it should be the why. On the right side of the training balance scale, where 10% of your focus should be, it should be the how. Most of us are how-thinking individuals. We how ourselves out of every opportunity. Well, how am I going to do that? And how are we going to change this situation? And you come up with everything that you need to do. But then you, you cancel yourself out because I'm not smart enough. I'm not experienced enough. I don't have the right degrees. I'm not old enough. Every justification not to do what you ultimately want to do because you're soaked and saturated in how thinking. But if you have a strong enough why, yes. if you are, if your marriage is at death's door, if it's being held together by a string, you got to have a strong why for doing this. Yes. The question becomes, why are you here? Mm. Are you just here because you wanted a remote, a remote destination to get away from and just to have a cute time over the weekend? Or are you here for something deeper than that, for something stronger than that? When you become soaked and saturated in your why, the how doesn't matter. Can I jump? I just, oh my The God. how is irrelevant. The how is irrelevant. And I want y'all to just, listen, y'all, we need to get out of this belief that things are supposed to come easy or it's not God. Okay? Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Y'all seen that meme? Nope, 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 nope. It's supposed to be hard. When we were going through... When we're talking about the A goals, doing what you already know how to do, we knew how to plan. We knew how to get the ball rolling for our trip. B goals, pursuing what you think you can do. We knew once the, the, the floor dropped from under us, we could still book a hotel. We could figure that part out. What we didn't know, which is C goals, is pursuing what you have no idea how to do. We didn't know what was going to happen on the other end. That is a place of empowerment. When you have done all that you can and now you only can stand, that's where the miracle happens. We need to start looking for miracle opportunities. And God has blessed you with one under your roof. You are frustrated with your partner. You don't understand what to do. You don't know how to communicate with them. You don't want to be intimate with them. That is the problem. You can submit that to God. Change the way that you think and watch a miracle take place.
before, oh, before Asani and I came out, we just prayed. We were like, we need them to, to get this. We don't want another session where people say, mm-hmm, yep, mm-hmm, and you go home and you don't know what they talked about. When you leave here, we want you to implement what we're saying. We want you to immediately release. Do y'all know what exoneration means? To release and let go of fully. Sometimes we have to do things with abandon. That means I don't have a parachute. I don't know if they're gonna do me right. I don't know if they're gonna hurt me again. All I know is that I've done all I can, now I'm gonna stand. When you get into a position where you do that, the miracles open up and you also enter into the peace of God. That's why people look at you and they're like, how are you going through this? And you're not even moved. It's the peace of God. We're talking about the importance of creating the marriage you want. The way that you do that is by creating what we call the impossible marriage. See, you know what's possible for you, but you're not bold enough to step into great impossibilities, right? So when you think about your sex life, when you think about communication, when you think about your finances, when you think about all the things that you're struggling with, to believe that it's possible to have something more, we allow fear of the unknown, fear of failure, fear of success to stifle us and to keep us from pursuing what is impossible. But if you serve the living God, we know that he's able to take all possibility, all impossibilities and turn them into great possibilities. So you've got to tap into his power and to the authority that he's given you to walk in the impossible marriage. So how can you create an impossible marriage? You got to have impossible goals. And impossible goals have to be bold and unrealistic, unrealistic. and audacious and over the top and unconventional and can't be accomplished in my lifetime. If your goals do not excite you and scare you all at the same time, they're not big enough. You better say that again. Did you hear that? If they don't excite you and scare you, scare they you. are not big enough. Hassani, tell them what we do when we have a goal in front of us, when somebody slams the door in our face and it's a no. We get to dance and we're like, yes! We're excited. God's about to do something big because they said no. And can nobody say no to me but God? The word has already said yes. See, see, whatever you're trying to accomplish in your life, there's supposed to be opposition. There's supposed to be obstacles. There's supposed to be stumbling blocks. It's a part of the process. What you, what many of us do, including us, because it took us a long time to get here, we become afraid and we begin to rationalize and justify and excuse away why we can't do, why we can't have, why we can't be because an obstacle appeared in our way. But that is a part of the process because accomplishing, when you have a vision and a goal and a destination for something, it's not about accomplishing the goal. It's about the personal transformation that you're forced to experience in the process. Yeah. Goals are to help you grow, not to help you get. Yes. Let's say that again. Goals are to help you grow, not for you to get. You will get it as a result of the growth. So what makes it impossible? An impossible goal says, if I continue to be who I am, the way I've always been, the way I've always thought, the way I've always functioned, if I continue to be the person I've always been, no matter what the goal is, I'll never accomplish it. Because I have my own ways of thinking, my own patterns, my own habits that keep me trapped in my present reality. So in essence, I have to become someone I've never been in order to have something that I've never had. So it requires your personal growth and development and your transformation and the spiritual you know, power that exists within you. When you begin to tap into that, nothing is impossible. So if your goals, if you have punk goals, <laughs> if you have punk, average, mediocre goals, then be happy with that life that you have. But I want more for that in our marriage. I don't want more of the same because doing more of the same will just get you more of the same. I want goals that require me 
to be bold and unrealistic and audacious and over the top and unconventional and something that I can't even think I can accomplish in this lifetime. That's what I'm shooting for because as long as I got God on my side, it's going to happen. Yes. Amen. I'm going to pause for a little bit of applause on that. Hold on. I want to say one thing. Now, I want to point out that, you know, this is my person and this is the person that I stand with on everything, okay? That's the gift that he has for you in your relationship. You got to get there. Not everybody is there. There was a time when we were unequally yoked emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. But it only takes one of you to stand in the gap. Somebody said it the other day, go tell Jesus, tell on him. I can't tell you how many times I got in my closet and I told Jesus on his son. I said, your son ain't acting right. He ain't doing what he's supposed to do. Fix him. But when you understand, now you know how to implement these things. Reality? Who's reality? You got to know something, guys. You can't tell everybody everything. My reality mm. may not be your reality or your reality. You got to know who to tell things to because the truth is, is that I may not be able to trust you with my level of faith. I don't know your faith. I don't know what's in your heart. We don't know what's behind people's hearts. Some folks is waiting for you to fall. Some people, they got a divorce already, and they just waiting for you to get a divorce so you can be in their community. They ain't in this community. They in the other community. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? So sometimes you got to guard what it is that you're trying to do before the Lord, and you have that person who's going to guard it with you. Don't tell everybody everything. When you tell everybody everything, you're releasing that energy, and guess what? Prayers are words. Do you realize that? Your words go out and do things. I don't know what you're saying about me on your pillow talk. You see the pedophiles, what they're doing now. They need to stop. Who knows what they're saying? So what you do is you guard every intention that you have, and you keep it right here with your spouse. You pray together. You go to the Lord together, and you hold it. Because trust and believe, the manifestation will show itself. You don't have to go telling everybody and weakening your blessing. Because not everybody can carry your blessing. Do you understand that? Y'all better write that down, because we be talking, 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 and unraveling everything that God's trying to do. We're here telling you how to have an impossible marriage. Mm. It was, it was, uh, <laughs> it, do you know who that guy is? Muhammad. It was Muhammad Ali who said that impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in a world that they've been given than to explore the power that they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact. Impossible is an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration. It's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. <laughs> see, 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 when you begin to realize what is possible for yes. you, it changes the game. But it requires that you change your mindset. You got to change your mindset. You got to change how you use these mental faculties that God has given us. We got to scroll through a whole bunch. We okay, want to hit this one. Yeah. Let's hit this one, okay. and then we're gonna scroll through because I, I know I know we got time here. Let's hit this. Okay. One of the things that keep you trapped in your reality is your comfort zone. Many of you don't like the situation you're in, but you're comfortable with it. It's safe. It's predictable. I can trust it. Like for instance, if we're not emotionally connected and there's distance and space between us, well, it's been like that for so long. You know what, I'm just used to this norm. I don't like it, but, but, but I'm used to it. At least I can trust what this is. And the moment we begin to move closer, the moment she says, you know what, I'm gonna reach out to Hassani, I wanna connect with Hassani, I wanna be intimate with Hassani immense, mentally, emotionally, and physically, I, I, I can't trust that. I can't, I don't know what that is. So, so even though I desire it, I can't trust it, so I have to do something to create the distance that exists between us. So, so because as long as I'm in my comfort zone, I'm good. But in order to step out of your comfort zone, it means that you've got to get into your fear zone. What is the source of your fear? It is the fear that is holding you back from having the marriage that you want. It's those internal conversations and that dialogue that you're having with yourself, right? We talked about how oftentimes we think these negative thoughts, and even though I'm having conversations with my wife, while I'm having it with my wife, I'm having conversations with myself all at the same time. And the conversations that I'm having with myself is creating the distance, because within me, there are what we call these internal breaks 
right? So I want to reach towards, but something reminds me of what she said two weeks ago. So the break is put on and I don't reach out. And so, and so I'd rather be in my comfort zone than, than have to deal with the fear. So, so, so how do I get into the growth zone? I got to go through the fear and begin to learn. And this is where being teachable comes into play. See, many of us are just not teachable. We're, we're, we're not coachable. The pastors talk about the importance of learning and unlearning in order to learn something new. We've got to give up some ways of thinking that do not serve us. See, when we were on the verge of divorce, the reason why we didn't is because I made the decision to divorce me from myself. I had to give up ways of thinking. I had to give up certain beliefs and convictions and values and philosophies that did not serve my marriage and did not serve my life. And when I began to unlearn things that did not help me and began to learn new things, it allowed me to stretch into the possibilities of my marriage. And so here we go. Let me read it. We took our goals, we took the things that we wanted for our lives, and we turned them into daily affirmations. And every single day, we will repeat this. You can read it. I am ecstatic about my ever-growing, fun, and exciting, spiritually in tune, intellectually stimulating, purpose-driven, passionately, sexually fulfilling, hot, monogamous, explorative marriage that keeps unfolding day by day. See, you got to confess this when there is no sex. You got to confess this when you don't have great communication with your spouse. You got to confess this when you are living in a desert. This is what you need to speak. And when you speak it, the world should think that you're crazy because what you're saying doesn't line up with your reality. But you just got to let them know, I'm working on something. I'm working on something. I'm working on something. Most of us focus on what we don't want rather than focusing on what we do want. And the more you think a thing, you give it power, you give it energy, it begins to magnetize in your life. And see, because we are magnets, if I'm thinking negative thoughts and speaking negative words, I begin to attract into my life situations and circumstances that reinforce what's going on on the inside of me. So how is it that two couples who live right next to each other going through the same struggles three years from now have a different reality? Because one couple is doing the necessary work, regardless of their circumstances. They're doing the necessary work. They're getting in the Word. They're praying. They're meditating. They're confessing. They have positive affirmations. They're working on their mindset, and boom, transformation happens while the other couple is still stuck in the same rut because no one was willing to do the necessary changes required to get what it is that they wanted. So you got to do that. You got to work on this mind. Now, tell me how much time we have. All right. Can we go a little bit longer? Okay. We want to give you some principles that we think are going to help you. So we're going to skip. Here we go. This is important because how are we using our minds? We have to understand that we have five senses, the ability to see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. However, God has put within us the six mental faculties, which are reason, intuition, perception, will, memory, and imagination. So when the scripture says we walk by faith, not by sight, Hassani's translation is we walk by faith, not by senses, not by what we see, not by what we hear, smell, taste, and touch. And so anyone operating in sensory knowledge is living life from the outside in meaning their internal mood and emotion and state is based upon the outside world, what they see, what they experience. But as believers, we live life from the inside out. Do you see the difference? So we're not living life based upon the circumstances and the conditions and what our senses perceive. We're using the power of the six mental faculties that God has built into us when he designed us from scratch. Because even though we live in a world, there's a world that lives within us. And when we, excuse me, when we begin to, to manage and properly master the world that lives within us, it transforms our life. That's why every single morning, my wife, myself, our four kids, we say, today belongs to me. It, it must, must submit, submit to, to my, my will. will. 
and my will is in perfect alignment with the will of God. That's living life from the inside out. So regardless of the situation, regardless of the conditions, regardless of what's happening in the world, if I stand strong in the word, in faith, in wisdom, if we become rock solid in our approach, the circumstances have to bow to our will because we are connected to the will of the Father. So let's break down these six mental faculties. 15 minutes, I promise. Okay. Okay. Mental faculty number one, perception. Perception is is the ability to see, hear, or become aware of something through the senses. It's a way of interpreting something. When we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. Perception is synonymous with our beliefs. So in order to change our perception, we must take on the beliefs associated with the results we want and let go of the current beliefs that keep us trapped in our current state. Perception is everything, folks. Your perception is your reality. Is that not right? Yeah. So in a relationship, we are wired different. We think different. We process different. We react and respond different. We have different perceptions. Many of you have seen that image of a, two people standing in front of a, uh, each other, and there's a number on the ground, and they're fighting over what the number is. One saying, it's a nine. The other one saying, no, it's a six. Well, from my perspective, from my vantage point, this is a nine. And if I, we talked about this yesterday, if we embrace the principle of empathy, which is what? Seeing with someone else's eyes, hearing with someone else's ears, and feeling with someone else's heart, if I can do that, I then can come on the other side and see what you see. Oh, that is a six. I could see how you would see that from your perspective. And what happens is the reason why there's discord and dissension and disagreement in relationships, neither of us are willing to budge. We want our spouse to see things our way 